everybody's got their, uh, give you uh, about another minute or so to write down your mystery photo guesses. There are prizes that come with said mystery photo guess. So while you're filling those out, blows me away uh, the support I get from this community. The people are pretty special. I hope you really realize that. And uh, I can't thank you enough. Like this is a this is a pretty uh, stellar turnout. There have been lots of uh, hugs today and lots of uh, lots of warm greetings. So uh, pretty neat. I don't want to get too sentimental, but uh, this has been the job of a lifetime, and uh, it's set me on a crazy path. That uh, phone call I got from Rosemary Parent back in uh, September 2012. And yeah, that's how long I've been doing this. And uh, yeah, 11 crazy years going from unemployed geographer to professional archivist. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so it's leading me away to make it official. I've been doing this uh, sort of uh, archive technician is the term we came up to sort of say what I did without actually full out calling me an archivist, but, uh, you know, because I'm a geographer, I'm not an archivist. I'm an archivist now. So it's time to go to uh, grad school and make it official. If you saw the poster, you can tell by the colors on the poster of the flag of the country I'm going to, and it's, yes, I'm going to the African Republic of Cote d'Ivoire. No, I'm moving to Dublin, University College Dublin. A lot of people, everybody asks me, it's a master's in archives and records management. So that's what I'm doing. So I want to thank Columbia Basin Trust for sponsoring this event. Allowing us to, you know, the fact that we needed a hall to fit all of you in here is pretty crazy. Now it blows me away. Um, and most of all, I just want to thank all of the uh, wonderful people, well, all the volunteers, because uh, Air Lakes Historical Society is entirely volunteer run. Um, you know, and it's without volunteers, nothing happens at that place. And it's, um, yeah, you guys that have given me that job and allowed me to <laughs> have my way with things sometimes. And, uh, you're all been very generous. I can't believe how many people have traveled here from out of town. That kind of blows me away. Um, we always get a decent local turnout, but like, I always, like, just, yeah, like people literally, yeah, from hundreds of kilometers away. I haven't seen Jim Holland in like 12 years. That, that, it's so cool, it's so cool. I guess we're uh, doing the honor system here with this mystery photos, because I don't think everybody has the time to count 80 ballots. So, well, I'm gonna skip forward to the beginning of the show here, and then I'll go through and see how many you got. We tried it on two people in the office. One got three and one got six. Those are people that work at the Historical Society. So I'm counting on you guys to show up the Historical Society members. I actually told Phil McMeckin yesterday that there was going to be McMeckin-related content in this lunch room. That's his aunt. She was the teacher at Galena Bay School in the 1940s. So that is Galena Bay School. Charlotte McMeckin, 1944. Uh, speaking of around that way, that's Ferguson. That's Main Street Ferguson, 1910. <laughs> that's Andy Daly's uh, pack train going down the middle of Ferguson. That's still the same road that's the Main Street of Ferguson today. Just picture a bunch of snowmobile cabins there instead. Victoria Avenue, this is actually Avenue. This one, if you've been in the cusp since 19, in the 70s, this is a giveaway. This is the old livery, uh, which was a little uh, secondhand what's-it store. 
attached to the side of the old small hall. That was torn down in 1977 to uh, make way for the liquor store. So this is where the liquor store was. Yeah. And at what, so they took, yeah, so that was torn down in 77, liquor store was born in 78. The first iteration of the Lord Minto, Bobby Nowak, when, before it was a restaurant, it was just a deli slash ice cream parlor was actually in that side, and then he moved next door the next year. Okay, we're going back to 1983 and the big gas tanker crash at Summit Lake. Thirty thousand liters. The driver got out fine. No one injured, but it was a big cleanup. That's Summit Lake Town Site, Summit City. This is right on top of where Camp Valhalla, the old Three Island Resort, is. But yes, there was actually a town site there between 1909 and 1925. There were seven forest fires that summer, and they put out six. And that was the end of Summit City. <laughs> the Lakeview Hotel, Front Street, Arrowhead. 1906. Arrowhead had a thousand people at one point. This is a gimme. This is an easy one. Just look at the pipes. That's the dining room of Leland. <laughs> Bird's eye view, Trout Lake, 1974. That's when the village of Trout Lake was at its lowest. So that's actually the town right in the middle there. It's a lot more full now with all the cabins and new houses. I figured this one would be hard for people. That's the Renata General Store, 1965. And that little annex on the side of the store is the Renata Post Office. All right, last one for the mystery photos. That is Herman Hohenleitner and Paul Gensick standing in front of the Browse Water Tower, 1934. Uh. All right. So you got everything tallied up? You got your scores? Because uh, I got some two-year memberships in the Air Lakes Historical Society to give away. And so if you're a member, hey, you don't have to pay. That means you're two years ahead. And if you're new here, hey, you're now one of us. Welcome to the club. You can't leave. <laughs> All right. Who got 10? <laughs> No, no one? No. No. Nine? Eight. Okay, seven won the Christmas dinner this year. So seven? Ooh. I thought this was easier than the Christmas one. Okay. Six. <laughs> Five? Oh. Four. Come on. Four. Yay, sure. Okay. Anybody else with four? On a 
That's chance for four. How about three? Somebody's got three. A bunch of people got three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of you have three. Okay. What? So we'll do some. Yeah. So we'll do some more. But if you got your uh, hand up. There we go. Okay. Okay. So about halfway through, we're gonna do a little ten-minute intermission because that's been requested just for people to get air. It's really warm in here. And of course, please, for the love of all that is good in the world, you and your cell phones for the duration of the show. <laughs> okay. So here we go. So I'm hoping my show tonight for you people goes a lot better than that flight did for Hufty. <laughs> if you don't know the theme tonight, it's literally just photos that entertained me. <laughs> Yeah. This wasn't Huffy, but it is one of his slides. He gave us, gosh, probably 600 amazing full-color slides. All his travels, working in forestry, firefighting, uh, hiking, backpacking, camping. So the really crazy moments. This is on the beach at Nelson. That's Ellison's Market on Front Street up on the top there. That's the old city hall with the... Uh, brown roof on top there, but yeah, that's, <laughs> they were, they got up fine, this pilot passenger. This is a really cool uh, old times slide, uh, 1957, Charlie Slade, he was the longest lived, the person who lived at West DeMars the longest, if you don't know where West DeMars is, that's where the Bahamas are now, across from the Don Creek Park. Uh, he lived there until 1930, 1929, and then he moved up to Arrowhead. And so he was the forest ranger based out of Arrowhead most of the mid-century. And he was most famous for surviving a bear mauling. Yeah. Yeah. And he also saved thousands of negatives which we are lucky to have. A lot of the film came from his parents, who came from Essex in England. And so you just find random cool photos in those negatives like this. This guy apparently uh, was a, yeah, he was an MBE, member of the British Empire order. This was, yeah, this is somebody's actual house at West of Mars, 1920, an old school sod house. Could you imagine living in that? One of the early Chinese-Canadian pioneers uh, in town was Sam Henry. Sam Henry was an early businessman in town. He was the guy that started the farm that is now the Spicer Farm. It, he subdivided the two blocks of land that are now right in front of the hospital. And he's famous for having four wives. And these are the... Uh, yeah. And they all look so happy. <laughs> so, uh, as you can see, here's another uh, old timer of note. Yes, this is an actual postcard because lots of po lots of old photographs you'll find are actually printed on old uh, postcards. Um, because that was the paper that people had lying around. We believe that this is the infamous Fanny Sinclair, who is the madam up in Comoplex. Comoplex, if you don't know, was a site of the largest spruce mill in the British Empire. It burned down in 1915 during uh, World War I when the company that owned it was based in England. They couldn't get access to their timber because of the war, so they decided to have somebody uh, get rid of the town for them so they could get rid of the bill and claim the insurance and that was the end of Comoplex 
at low, low water, you can still see the ruins of the burner at, at the mill. Where is it called? It is on the Beaten Arm, about seven kilometers west of Beaten, like a third of the way towards Arrowhead on the Beaten Arm. And there's still a small cemetery up there in the woods. And uh, most of the town went away. The SS Revelstoke burnt up at the dock along with the town. That's actually the paddle that's now installed in front of the visitor center. A lot of people think it's the Minto. It's the not. It's the SS Revelstoke. But uh, some of the workers' cabins were up there. And as legend has it, you could still hear uh, Fanny St. Clair rattling around in those cabins. <laughs> She met an untimely uh, death uh, at the hand of somebody, but we never officially determined who. Ah, uh, the good old days. Yeah, somebody entered an outhouse in the July 1st parade in 1958. Hmm. Not to be confused, uh, I can't tell if you can read that because of the focus, but uh, I don't know if the name Shithouse Corner stuck around for very long. <laughs> but as you can see, it's the corner directly opposite the campground entrance. We all love driving over the Monashi on the one-lane bridge over Deep Creek. Yeah. Well, hey, that's what it used to look like. Wow. You had to go down to the very bottom and cross down there on this. So, yeah. They later replace it with the modern highway. So this is when they're blasting the highway around that switchback in 1922-23. So there, this is a uh, surveyor scrapbook that Annette Devlin brought me and I got to scan through it. So it's really cool. It has all the measurements and everything. And, but lots of before and after photos of when they were building the Monashi Highway. So just a picture of the switchback at Deep Creek. So here's what it looked like before. And then there they are blasting away. Yep. Yeah. Built by hand. They during World War One when they were first building it, they actually used the interny labor from the Edgewood Internment Camp. Lots of uh, Ukrainian Canadians were uh, yeah, forcibly detained in those camps. And uh, yeah, were put to work for thirty-five cents a day to build this highway. Thirty-five cents a day, which they could only spend at the store at the internment camp. But, so it's, yeah. that's why we have that big plaque there now at Don Siller Park. So this is a few years after that. So this is just regular construction crews now. And again, the, it's not like you're getting big uh, paving trucks out there or big rock drills. Like this is all by hand. So before and an after. Like look back, you see those trees? There it is there. Here's a before. There's an after. Here's a before. There's an after. And they only blasted away that part of the curb like eight years ago. That's still that big pile of rocks you see right before Deep Creek. But they didn't actually move the roadbed. They just cleared the corner and left the roadbed on the side. So you're still driving on that same roadbed today. There's a before, and there's an after. And like I said, like the, it came with everything. So here's where you know, they're going to blast this part away so they can take that rock and then fill in the other part, level the grave. And then there, they are building the predecessor to the modern bridge. So how'd you like to be working on top of that? <laughs> Long way down. Oh yeah, it's not actually called Deep Creek. The legal name is Galloping Creek. 
but uh, everybody calls it Deep Creek so much that highways even put a sign called Deep Creek. And you can see those uh, fancy road barriers on the side of the road. Nice solid wood. That'll hold all those cars in place. The original Monashi Highway included a giant switchback atop Monashi Mountain. So the Kiefer Lake Road, the highway actually went up there, switched back, and then came back down uh, near Spruce Grove. So when I say switchback, I mean you actually had to go up, back up, and then go down. Like switchback, switchback. Yep. <laughs> Theoretically, you can still get up there. And uh, of course, who doesn't love the giant snowbanks? That's a great shot. Um, if you don't know, we have over 1,600 photos from the Spicer family collection in our collection, and they're stunning. Ah, the ferry. Um, not as uh, advanced as our modern uh, folk here of Needles Ferry. That is Ruben Berge's freight truck being pulled out of the lake after falling off the ferry. And you can see how the ferry operated. It was a barge, and then the boat was on the side towing the barge, and it could hold one car. Believe it or not, they actually crossed. They finished the crossing. It was precarious, but they did it. That's the original Arrow Park ferry. So this is the ferry that John Robbins uh, operated. This is the last year of regular seasonal floods before the dam, 1967. So this was like the last time that a natural flood happened on the lakes, and uh, these cars got through. This would be way down below where the highway is now. This would be below where the modern Burton Wharf is south of town. <laughs> A lot of people think this shot is of the Cape Horn Slocan Bluffs, but it's actually not. It's between Nelson and Balfour. And as you can see, uh, yeah, nothing like driving under half a mountain looming over top of you. People's collections, of course, will have photos from just out of town that, for whatever reason, we hang on to in our collection if we can't find a home for them elsewhere, or if they just fit with somebody's collection. You want to talk about snowbanks? There's what becomes Highway 6 at Hills, 1933. The person who donated this on the back wrote, back when we had real winters. <laughs> I mentioned uh, Huffy Hewitt at the beginning. Here, in front of his brand new uh, shop, 1968, yeah, there was a bit of snow. And they get that car out. <laughs> uh, early road traveling, Crescent Bay, 1930s. Even though Crescent Bay was first developed and subdivided in 1907, it really didn't start filling up to the 60s. So you would have like a farm and then just like 10 lots that are, hadn't been claimed yet. And so most of the roads in Crescent Bay right into the mid 60s look like this. This is just bad timing. This is a rock drill from Galena. Fred Piggott was the driver. Just happened to be going by the gravel pit on the Hot Springs Road at the same time that the gravel pile gave way. So it buried him and buried the truck driver in front of him. <laughs> How's that for a motorcycle, huh? That, that just looks like a modern e-bike, honestly. But yeah, this is a glass plate that was in the John Nelson connection that uh, Rodney Eel saved. So this is somewhere in England during World War I, but it's just, you know, it's a glass plate 
which glass plates, by the way, pains in the butt to scan. Uh, you don't want to break them. You're scared of touching them. That's the other thing. You, you'd never believe this. I hate touching old stuff. I can't stand it. I hate touching old photos. I hate. Ah, I, I just feel like I'm going to catch something or I'm going to tear something in half. Or, ah, uh, yeah, weird, right? Like, So when you drive between Meadow Creek and Girard on Highway 31, you are driving on the old rail bed that connected the end of Trout Lake to the SS Moye at Lardo. And that was the train. That was the train. That was the No, it was a speeder car. Yep. And yeah, those are passengers. Those are actual train passengers. Um, so that ran uh, between uh, 26 and 42, something like that. That's what it looked like when it had a car behind it. Not quite big enough to hold a canoe. <laughs> this is an action shot. This is a young kid being pulled down the center of Broadway in the 1950s. And like you can still totally tell where this is. There's the courthouse. There's what's brewing. There's the Sean's bike shop, right? Like, all those buildings are still there, just in different configurations. That's one of my favorite shots. It's just such a perfect blend of color. It's got its parade, so it's Harold Doyle's old car that was always in all the old parades. You've got the Bluebird Cafe in the back. That's the Valley Food Store now, right? So, but it's the original version that was torn down in 73 to make way for the next version, yeah. right? But yeah, just such a great shot. Lots of good colors in there. Okay, this is Jory's Red and White Store, early 1960s. So... That means that baby is either going to be Keith or September, I'm guessing. Gron. That store is now the general store, but this was the second supermarket in the cusp, which operated until uh, 79 under a different, bunch of different names. But it opened in 57 and it'll operate until 79. So. This is a great shot. This is, so as you can see, Empire and Sunflower Ranches. This is an Ernest Bill postcard. The original Glenbank School is that building against the trees in the top left, right where Shakespeare turns into the Cusp East Road. This farm that you're looking at right now is now the Harper property. And then you can see the roads making down to the Cusp at the top right. So Shakespeare Road, basically, the first family to settle on Shakespeare Road were the Bowes family, who are the progenitors of the Friedenbergers. They settled on that corner in 1903, and they've been there ever since. And everybody else started moving in around 06, 07, 08. And a lot of those families still have those properties. A lot of your early McCuss families, like uh, the Kirks and the Gardners and the Briggs and the Crolls all tied to that Sleepy Hollow area. Don't know where this is, but it's a pretty cool shot. Um, train derailments seem to happen about every year or so for the first 10 years of the railway. And a few uh, workers were killed. But I don't know the particular story behind this one. Now that's traveling in style. You can tell it's somewhere up the lake because of the steep rock mountain walls. And you can tell by the clothing it's probably around the turn of the century. Yeah, I, I can't imagine getting dressed up like that now to go on a <laughs> boat now. Or have two jump flights mounted on either side. That's a shot of the SS Minto, 1967, on the waterfront 
the Nelson Farm in Galena Bay. Uh, so we've got Kate Johnson, Walter Nelson, John Nelson. John Nelson passes away that December. Uh, the Minto is burned the following year because that's when the water is going to start coming up and they have to get it off the shore. It would have been $100,000 in 1968 money to restore it. So you're talking about a million dollars now. And with the cost of supplies these days, proportionately, you're probably talking about three million. So just impossible for a farm to afford. It. So that's why they towed it out and gave it a Viking funeral. Because there was really nothing else they could do with it. You can see here, it's pretty rotted. Yeah, there it is when they were doing the final inspection, 1968. And it's, by that time, it had been sitting there for 12 years. The cusp, 1892. So, there's the Leland on the very left when it's probably about a month or two old. The Madden Hotel, which later became the Grand Hotel, that was the first, and that was there until 1925 when it burned. And it's only now that they're finally building something on that property after all those years. And that's the customs house that people would uh, come in and off the boat and check in at, at the bottom. But you can tell it's very early because they haven't even cleared all the trees and the stumps yet. That is the oldest photo of the cusp. As you can see, there's nothing there. They just started logging it in about May 8, 1892. That's just a cool shot because it kind of jumps out at the screen. That big giant Rossland in Vancouver. All the ships are always uh, registered in Vancouver, so that's why it says of Vancouver. But you can see the Grand Hotel at that, and you can see that little house behind it. That's still there. That's uh, that's Kim and Steve Kane's house. So the old McPhee house. And then the Bourne Brothers General Store is on the waterfront in front. <laughs> you, if you didn't grow up here uh, before the mid-60s and have an idea where the old Anglican church was, you'd have no idea that's where Save on Foods and Credit Union are now. So that was originally built as the first Macau School in 1894. It became the Anglican Church in 1898. And uh, it was torn down in 68 after uh, they acquired the new church that they brought up from Arrow Park. Here we go, 1910. So you are where you can see right in the top left, you can just see the banner that says J. Kroll. So Joe Kroll's uh, workshop, he was the undertaker. And that is uh, where uh, the trendy tread side of such a fashion is now. And then that house, the number two, uh, that house was there forever. Um, Jordan House, Barron House, like, so a few different families lived in there. That's now where the Valley Food parking lot is. And then uh, across the street is uh, the Custom Meat Market. And that's where the Columbia Basin Trust Office is now. And it, this, is, uh, this is actually one of Bill Robinson's old photos that he used to teach with. That's why I wanted to. That's why the number two is written on there in red. And the cusp laundry. This is right up the street going that way, about half a block. Uh, so, yeah, so it's a bit off the main street. And even and because at this point, most business was still down on the waterfront instead of Broadway, it's even further around. This is like the middle of the woods back then. Now it's, like I said, it's half a block up the street on your right. This is just, you can't imagine this now. Just a bunch of people walking their horses down an alley in the cusp. 
but I like it because it's casual. You don't see a lot of casual shots. These all, everything's all staged. And, How the shack uses temporary Lardo school, September to November 1929. Yeah, a, a literal tar paper shack until they actually built a proper school. She was Edna Angrenon of uh, New Denver at the time. She later became Edna Greenlaw. And of course, the Greenlaws owned the store in Lar uh, Meadow Creek forever. Speaking of old stores, that's a cool shot. Arrowhead Co-op Association. So this is on the main street in Arrowhead. You can see the old gas pump, right? You know, like, like some of the buildings in Arrowhead were pretty outstanding compared to the ones here. Uh, we saw Galena Bay School in the mystery photos. Here's parents and children arriving for a picnic. Galena Bay School. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the classic one-room schoolhouse. That's the one that... You'll never see another building like this, ever. Never, ever. There wasn't one knot of wood in that entire uh, hotel. Everything was straight, pure wood. And of course, that's the original St. Leon Hot Springs that we lost in 68. One of the cool things I did this week was I got to lead a group of school district 10 teachers up for a history talk up to the old hot springs. Hot history, we called it. And so I got to show them all this. And I said, if you go online, if you look at photos from the 50s, you'll see where all the buildings were, but you'll see them like falling down in the background. So if you go up there to the source, like the first thing that you see when you get up there is that little concrete box with the creek running through it, and that's what they're sitting at, right? And then you have all the buildings which were maintained up until the mid 40s starting to fall apart in the background. Like that one that's sort of like a half, that's already half collapsed, that was the main pool. It was indoors, it was an indoor building, it was an indoor pool, but it's already being stripped in here. And basically, by the time you get to the 60s, there's nothing left up. Everybody stripped it, or it's just fallen down. And of course, we didn't get the modern resort until 1974. So for 20 years or so, that's how people remember going to the hot springs. It's rare to see that in color. Here's what it looked like 15 years earlier. So you have the bathhouse, you have the big pic uh, picnic roundhouse in the middle, in the middle ledge. You have all the cabins where people could come and stay. It was a Class C provincial park, so they actually had a small community-run parks board, and they had a caretaker that lived on site. They even had a small portable sawmill because you can't hike all that wood up the trail. So if you had repairs to do, the caretaker did it on site. <laughs> There's the small plunge pool at Halsey in 1910. That almost just looks like they're about to be buried in cement. <laughs> That's how I remember Halcyon as a kid. Of course, there was no resort between 55 and 99, so a pool was built at the source, high up on the mountain. There's the Halcyon Cemetery around the turn of the 40s. Um, so there were a handful of people that lived out at Halcyon, and uh, most of them were buried there. There's nostalgia for people of my generation. Brownies fried chicken. And of course, there's like a giant gouge in the side of the bucket. Oh, if you're really keen, you'll remember when it was Perfecto Pizza, like 87, 88, 89, before, right before it became Ricardo. I mentioned the, uh, that is, remember I showed the livery and the old uh, store. That's them burning that to get rid of it to build the new liquor store. So they did a controlled burn of it. But that building was originally the parish hall, which most people called the small hall. And that was 
a, a small community hall, a, a little smaller than this building. Yeah. yeah, that was a community hall there for uh, basically 60 years, 70 years. First day of skating at the original Nakaska Arena, the one that was built during 7071. In January 1970, they didn't close it, but they hadn't finished the insides yet, but they let people come in and skate anyway, so they just froze the ground, flooded it, and people came in and skated. So that's a fantastic shot. And uh, that's eight years later. I'm not going to rat out the name of the guy wearing the uh, bell-bottom jeans in the front of the photo. Yeah, he's sitting about three rows back. <laughs> Nobody gets out of here for free. There's the ruins. That's what it looked like. But this time it was insured and they almost immediately started work on the current arena back behind this. So this arena sat where the parking lot is now. So they just built behind it, like almost right away. They got it. And, with, and by the time we get to the end of 1979, the current arena is already built. So they did it really quickly. So before we get to our intermission, I can't just take it out of my family. I have to take it out on lots of people. So. Uh, uh, this is from the opening day program, the first ever opening day program that the Kinsmen put out for the opening of the new arena in 1971. And you've got all kinds of uh, awesome photos of uh, people uh, who are still uh, prominent Nikuskians to this day. So I'll let you uh, <laughs> absorb some of these names as we go through them. Um, yeah. Great, I'll go to the next one. So the, so those banners, we've got some uh, older kids in this one. I mean, you can kind of guess ages, but I don't want to necessarily age people here, other than the fact that it obviously says 71. Yeah. And the girls don't get away either. So here's the sk figure skating club from that same program. Because it's a bigger picture, you can't quite zoom in on the faces as much, but... Uh... <laughs> Watching everybody squint and squirm. I love it. <laughs> and those were the rink rats that cleaned up the rink. So Merv Cusick was the head of maintenance, and that was his uh, crack staff of uh, kids. Right. Okay, so in this one, I'll read out the names. So we've got Merv Cusick on the left. That's Warren Jones, Terry Doherty's in the back, and then Bruce Lloyd, Billy Blair, and Cam Leach. Yeah. So with that, we'll call a 10 minute intermission. We're gonna be right back here at eight for the rest of it. And, uh, and I believe I also have a raffle to do for another prize with those tickets that you would have been handed. So we'll just let you stretch your legs for a bit and then I'm gonna start up again right when that clock on that wall hits eight o'clock.
Can we get everybody to please take their seats? We're going to hijack the mic for a few minutes from Kyle. I'd like to introduce Marilyn Taylor, the president of the Air Lakes Historical Society, to say a few words. Hi, everybody. I want to tell you about Kyle Cush and the Air Lakes Historical Society archives. Now, he's already told you that he started working in 2012, but what I want to tell you about is what he found when he started working there. He found 10-year-old uh, thumbnails of Milton's negative collection, but they were on a CD, ROM, that was, it was, they were just too tiny to really be useful. None of the photograph collection had been digitized. Interviews of old-timers that Milton had done over the years were on reel-to-reel -reel tapes or on cassette tapes. Neither the photos nor the interviews were available to anyone who didn't go to the office. So what's the difference in 2023? Kyle has digitized 35,415 photographs, and I think negatives, right? And negatives. Uh, 28,888 of these are freely available on the website for you to look at, for anyone to look at. 29,050. <laughs> <laughs> it's a work in progress. 472 interviews were digitized. And most of them are available to listen to online, too. They're not on our website. They're on a different site. But there's a link from our website to them. Now, for copyright and privacy reasons, there are some that you still would have to come into the office to listen to. At one point, Kyle found an old laptop hidden on a bookcase in the archives. And this was in the old archives that was at, at, by BC Hydro Building. It had the beginning of a slideshow created by Milton entitled, Our Colored Past. So this became the inspiration for Kyle's first ever slideshow, right? And he later evolved it into first a DVD that we sold, and then it became a book, Our Colored Past. Since then, Kyle has created many very interesting slideshows. I looked on YouTube and I counted 17 that are available for anyone to watch, and I think I've got that number right, complete. So, since 2012, Kyle has moved the archives into the 21st century. Now, in 2023, he's ready to move on. We're all extremely grateful to him, and we wish you all the best in your future endeavors, Kyle. Now, I'd like to introduce the Mayor, Tom Sesnick. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone. So, uh, just an incredible show by uh, Kyle. So, just a, just just watching some of that uh, brings back enormous memories of. Uh, so, just a little heads up. I grew up in Browse in the Slovak farm area, and I look around this room. Hal Wright, uh, Keith Coates, many many people. Why you're here? Because you've lived here all your life. And, and, you, and just watching some of this, those slides brings back so many memories. It's, it's almost like putting you right back in there. So I just love his shows. Uh, and anytime, every time Kyle puts a show on, uh, everybody just loves it. Uh, he's put on many forestry shows, for presentations for the forestry groups, and they just love it. Uh, First Nation, Indigenous groups, every, every, every show he puts on, it's, he, he uh, Brings it back to life. He's so passionate about passionate what he does. So uh, yeah. So just a little history. Slovak Slovak farm. Uh, the Browse Hall, uh, actually the Browse School. Believe, Browse School, believe it or not, uh, part of our house was built from the Browse School. So and and actually when they start ripping it all apart with the chainsaw, you can see the old remnants and you find some odd pieces from from the Browse School. And actually, the playhouse, we even put a playhouse out there that was the porch from the, there. So, just amazing uh, what you do, Kyle. Uh, so, anyway, over the years, I've witnessed uh, the growth in Kyle and his passion working and volunteering many, many hours at the Earl Lakes Historical Society, along with helping community and, and other volunteer groups over the years. Whenever new people or tours come to our community, where do I take them? I take them to the Nakusk Air Lakes 
Historical Society and our amazing museum. So uh, the last, I took uh, West Bank First Nations Chief Derrickson to our, uh, I said, I said where, where do we go? And he asked, where do I go? Well, you want to see some history? Let's go to the archives and the museum. And even in the museum, we have uh, a Sinaiix uh, tra traditional area and, and a canoe and uh, uh, many items there. So he loved all that and even the historical society. And I believe the book, what was the name of the book that you published? Colored Past. Colored Past. And uh, it's just amazing, amazing. Uh, that book was just amazing. Uh, whenever I meet with West Bank, West, West Bank First Nations or other indigenous groups, I give them a, a book of that, and they just fall in love with it. Um, oh, then after taking them there, I do take them to the hot springs, but uh, Arrow Lake Center <laughs> or a waterfront, but uh, museum and our archives and just what what you've done is just amazing. So yes, we will be sad to see you go. Uh, but we know we we wish we could keep you ever forever, but we know we can't. Um, we know that you what, what you're it's sad what you're going to show to everybody else uh, when you get to Dublin. Check out the bar, so and see if <laughs> and see if our Leland Hotel matches any of those pubs. Uh, so actually, when I uh, go to when I do the grad class ceremony at the end, I always tell them. Uh, go, out, go out on your journey and have your life experience, continue your education or career training, and remember you will always be welcome back with open, open arms to help us continue to build a great dynamic place to live. Never forget where you came from, but never let that hold you back from where you want to go. Thanks Kyle, you have made us all proud of your achievements, especially at this historical society, you along with Milt and Rosemary vision of building a new historical society and completing it is an amazing, amazing, amazing accomplishment feat, uh, to say, especially to save our invaluable history. So history is amazing. You know, if we didn't have this archives, uh, we would be lost. Um, so just think of the Columbia, you know, the flood in 67, the many, many homes we lost. So it's just, it's, so when new people come here, I always show them, hey, let's go to the archive. You want to see history? Look what look what BC Hydro did to our valleys and the and the provinces. Um, so I always tell them that you have also left the historical society in, in good hands. Going forward with an amazing, incredible individuals that have the same vision as you. And uh, also, I do have a little village memorabilia I'm going to give to you. So when you're going to the pubs and things like this, you can really put that on you, and that'll say where you're from. And also, oh, listen, I got something else. Oh, so when you come back, you will get an old adult bill pass to the hospitals. <laughs> So oh, thank you very much, Kyle. You've done an amazing job. And to the crew of the new uh, historical archives, you've got a hard challenge to keep up. <laughs> thank you. Hello. Um, I've uh, said many thank yous and <clears throat> congratulations to <clears throat> to uh, Kyle already, but today I got a phone call from Auntie Rosemary, oh. and she said, you make sure that you say best wishes and congratulations and everything to <coughs> Kyle, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> and give him a big hug for me, and so I'm here to give the hug. <laughs> Just a, a little word from the museum. Carl has been a real bonus for us. We could go up, go upstairs, check anything out. Kyle would help you with whatever you needed. 
So we're really going to find a hole in our lives with Kyle gone. But as, uh, as we all know, this is a really a good thing for Kyle. So we'll wish him well. But <clears throat> don't forget your friends at the museum. <laughs> And I bring messages from the Nacust Public Library. The staff at the Nacust Library will miss Kyle's deep historical knowledge of the area, as well as his interesting conversation, read readily available across the hallway. Kyle was instrumental in helping the library put together its centenary history in 2021 and tracking down names and photos of our librarians. He's been a valuable part of our area and it's certain Kyle's talents will be appreciated wherever he ends up. Kyle, enjoy your ventures in Acadia, Acadia via, and in Ireland. Your friends at the Public Library. All right. Oh, uh, again, just, I can't say thank you enough. I really can't. It's been a crazy day. I can't go to the store without <laughs> people coming up to me. And to know that people have that much interest in what I'm doing is kind of bewildering, but it's very humbling. So, no. Uh, nope. This town's written all over me. It's embedded in me. It doesn't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no. They're isn't a Q-tip long enough to scrub it out of my brain. It's with me forever, and it's made me who I am, and I will take this town with me wherever I go. I promise. <laughs> All right, lights. Let's get back at it. So, uh, I left you with the people of my parents' generation. How about the people of my generation? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, you got off so easy because the next one in that series would have been the one with you in it. <laughs> but Keller got a third step. <laughs> This one's actually scanned out of a figure skating club program. And all these figure skating club programs are online. Actually, so you can actually go back and look through uh, uh, about 25 years of old programs here from all the different carnivals. You know, um, yeah, but as soon as I saw Dallas and Jamie, I was just like, okay, that's going to. Here's some older kids' activities and a referee who's very, very intense in doing his job, isn't he? Beat them up. That's in this very building. That, that happened right here. That's here. Here's a more casual photo. <laughs> but yeah, here's an early uh, party photo from the 40s. <laughs> Up until they built the McCuss Centennial Golf Club as a centennial project in the mid-60s, our golf course was in the rec grounds. And up until they renovated, uh, up until they built uh, Helen Zelznick Park and they did some tree clearing in the campground, you could actually still make out the layout of the six-hole golf course that was there. So sometimes the golf course and the... Uh, ball field sort of intersected, as you can see by the scoreboard in the background. Not the most maintained golf holes. <laughs> it's Robbie Obiashi there. But that's when uh, our ballpark was first built in the tent. And uh, it was actually designated a provincial park. Up until the village took it over after incorporation, it was actually Nacusp Recreation Provincial Park. 
And the old concession stand in that park was there right until the beginning of Hell's Hells Lake Park, right until the 2000s. That one's cool because it looks like a volcano. It's not. It's just a forest fire up on top, uh, behind Hufty there. But uh, that's a cool shot from downtown looking up at this giant plume. There's a great shot of the Leland. And then the stairs that used to walk down to get to Bay Street which is the street that we lost when they flooded here. Um, and I can't imagine why they decided to put a concrete erosion barrier on the waterfront, looking at that stable, stable, stable beach soil underlying the front of the town. But you turn around, and that was the switchback you would take to get down to the rest of the town. And uh, the shipyard, uh, was there, and you can still see the remnants of the shipyard ways at low water there, uh, just uh, west of the marina. And then there's Spicer's farm in the back. That is an amazing shot. It's such an amazing shot that Library and Archives Canada, when we got some uh, money to do uh, some scanning, they gave us uh, money to do 6,000 uh, photos. And, and then, of course, we had to show them the photos that we had done afterwards as proof of project completion. And they were so taken by this one that they turned it into a postcard that went all across Canada. So I think they printed a, a few hundred of them. But yeah, just an amazing shot of Nikosk in the 1960s. So five years before they start leveling everything. You can see the Leland in the middle, and then you can see what the waterfront looked like. Um, the Bow Vista Motel, right in the middle there, that was the building that they switched back up to Broadway, past the, where the marina is. They switched back it up to Broadway and installed it across from the hut. Those are the townhouse apartments now. That and the cell bar office were the two largest buildings that were moved. There's Broadway, 1962. Uh, this is the corner of Broadway and Nelson, so this is a highway junction, and you just think, this is six years before the hut. This is 12 years before they build the building where the pharmacy is now. So that whole block is kind of looking empty. It's amazing how much the town changed just in those 10 years, where it went from basically, be, Broadway went from being one quarter empty to looking pretty much like it does now. That's a great shot. Yeah. There's absolutely nobody sitting in the front row that's in this picture. But I love it because it's one of the few shots, uh, not only does it show how big the Connect Club was here in 61, but it also shows you the original Gardner Electric sign. Yeah. And uh, it shows you the original Credit Union building. Uh, which is now temporary occupied by H&R Block <laughs> before they move down the street. And uh, yeah, Bon Marche, still there. And it's been there since 1917. <laughs> yeah. So if you don't get the joke, the IWA, International Woodworkers Association, was the union that uh, ran the shop in, at the uh, Selgar Big Ben Mill, so the Kinsmen decided to have some fun with those initials when they dressed up as Trojans. Institute of Women in Adultery Inside Women Animals. Because it's a Trojan horse, right? They did this stuff in public, people. This is why I don't join clubs. <laughs> no names. I, I mentioned it in Ferguson in the uh, mystery photos. Here's a shot of downtown Ferguson uh, sidewalk in the 30s. I love the caption, Lewis Thompson, reformed professional pickpocket from England sent to Australia. <laughs> Yeah. 
doubly hilarious because there are actual Australians in the crowd tonight too. <laughs> a lot of people guessed that photo I had of, of Trout Lake was the head of Slocan Lake. No, that's the head of Slocan Lake. And that's the amazing shot, 1974. Ellis Anderson was one of the most famous postcard photographers to come out of the West Kootenai. He's based out of Creston. And all through the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s, he created these amazing shots. And we were very, very lucky to have Greg Nesteroff on our board because he uh, facilitated the transfer of uh, hundreds of Ellis Anderson negatives throughout the Arrow Lakes and Largo to us. And so we're able to ha have in our holdings sh shots like that that look like they're almost painted. We do have collections of photos from outside of town when they're part of collections of people who are photographers from the cusp because it's part of their collection. You don't want to break it up. And especially when it's hydroelectric related, we try to keep what we can because, of course, that defines our valley. Uh, so anything that's part of that hydroelectric process, we, we hold on to. This is the brilliant dam that you see as you drive into Castlegar from the north. This is when they were building it in 43. And that's what it looked like when it was done. So if I go back, you can see the difference in the water level. You can really see it in that knob in the curve. You can see how much it came up. That's Mica Dam. If, you have no, if you've ever been to Mica Dam and you don't know how big it is, that's how big it is. <laughs> it is one of the largest earth fill dams on the planet. And so it raised the level of water uh, hundreds and hundreds of feet. Uh, the spillway, it's stunning. That's what it flooded. And when I say flooded, I mean to the top of like that tree line. That's how big um, Kim Basket Lake is. That's the original Big Bend Highway, the original Trans Canada Highway. And all that's underwater now. What a gorgeous shot. This is Revelstoke Dam. You can see that this is uh, right before they actually complete the dam. So they haven't flooded yet, but they've logged the valley above Revelstoke in preparation for flooding. And so you see how many trees they have to clear. Because the Revelstoke Dam backs up all the way to Micah Dam. So that's a lot of land clearing. And you can see the original Highway 23 and then the new Highway 23 that they had to build just on top. Oddly enough, Micah Dam, because it was 10 years earlier, they had built the town of Micah Creek for the Micah Dam. And they would wind up flooding part of the town that they just built for this new dam. <laughs> so you can actually see where they built the new highway on top of a dike in the middle of the town and then where the streets go into the new reservoir, and the old highway goes into the reservoir. And that was a town that they had just built 15 years earlier. I mentioned uh, the moving of the Bo Vista Hotel to become the townhouse apartments. This is the other big building they moved, and this is the Selgar office. They moved across uh, the old highway to its current position. And you can see how much it just dwarfs that flat bit. And, of course, you have a loader towing as well. Uh, as I mentioned, the very first slide, uh, Hufty Hewitt's amazing slide collection of all the stuff he did around BC in the 60s and 70s, lots of aerial photos and uh, lots of those hydroelectric projects that he was involved in. This is Mackenzie. So if you've ever been to the town of Mackenzie, north of Prince George, um, this is when they were building the town. And so you can see how they've started uh, putting in uh, houses, but they haven't finished. And uh, Mackenzie is on Williston Lake, which is behind the Bennett Dam. The Bennett Dam, then they built the Peace Canyon Dam, and now they're building Site C. Williston Lake, it actually changed the climate of northern BC because it's so wide. And you just do not have the capacity to log a lake that's long. So that was the result. 
That's all dead trees in the lake. 1969. Um, this is uh, Carl Schwarzenauer of uh, Deer Park and his uh, housekeeper, Adeline Alderman. They lived at Deer Park. His family was from there. Uh, he was determined, at one point he said he was going to tie himself to a rock and let the water come over him rather than leave. Uh, he was still fighting BC Hydro for the compensation of his trap lines on his property when he passed away the year after this photo to the flu. But uh, they were relocated to Robson, and uh, these are his homemade protest signs. That's the last building that was burned. This is what, at what is now Blanket Creek Provincial Park. This is actually done in 1971, so a couple years after the dam. But... Uh, when they officially established Blanket Creek Provincial Park, they actually burned down the house, which was only built in 56. Um, this was the Domkey homestead. And there's actually a book that the Domkey's daughter, Ada Domkey Jarvis, wrote called 12 Mile Revisited, because this was the community of 12 Mile, halfway between Arrowhead and Revelstoke. Look, you can still find in places. Of course, we have a copy of the archives. But uh, yeah, there is a school, there is a ferry, when you see the remnants of the homestead at uh, Blanket Creek Provincial Park, this was it. And you just sort of, man, it's one of the more stunning, lack of a better term, photos in the collection. Yeah. That's the one I always use at Renata, this photo. It looks like a napalm scene out of a Vietnam movie. It's, uh... <laughs> That's what Renata looked like before. Just orchards everywhere. Because you had uh, Dog Creek and Renata Creek creating this big delta. So that's 65. That's 71. That's what it looked like after. You can still go there and see like old pontoons embedded in the grass. That's the end of Beaton. They're burning one little pot. This is looking from the parking lot of the Beaton Hotel. And there's one last building left on the mud flats. Maybe the most uh, famous battler against Hydro was Val Morton. This is his bomb, Lottie, clearing stumps on the Morton Ranch. You farm family and so they make did with the uh, equipment they had and look at that <laughs> pretty rusty <laughs> they were doing it and look at the, all those stumps by the way that's <laughs> phenomenal here's a short-lived hotel this is the Edgewood Hotel it only lasted eight years this was uh, on the old road up to Needles I correct me if I'm wrong those weren't real bricks that's just a facade <laughs> Just like fake shingles. But yeah, it only lasted from 47 to 55 then it burned. That's my, one of my favorite shots. That old Edgewood General Store. I love that shot. Just the, the colors that pop out of it. That's an old timey general store. You expect somebody to be sitting out there with a banjo on the front porch. <laughs> There's the Deer Park store, by the way. I love that, the vintage ads and all that. Downtown Trout Lake, 1968. There's the Windsor Hotel in the middle. The, during one of the, the short time that it was painted brown instead of white. Uh, the Trout Lake Resort store was on there. So at this time, the general store that we know now is still called Trout Lake Esso Service. If you talk to people then, the general store is that thing. And then across the street is the Trout Lake Resort, which was uh, resort cabins. And there's the Trout Lake Esso Service, what we know as the Trout Lake General Store now. Still the same pumps. One of those pumps came from Beaton Store, and the other pump came from the Sidmouth Store. So when they flooded, uh, they saved those pumps and brought them to Trout Lake. Fifty-four 
This is about 86, so, yeah. There's a general store. This is at Beasley, where the fire hall is, just west of Nelson. The Pop Inn. <laughs> Ice cold. Yeah. Jack Steer, a man ahead of his time. Baggy pants, backwards hat. <laughs> And Mrs. Steer absolutely not wanting to be photographed whatsoever, walking back into the store. But that's uh, Steer's general store in Burton. Uh, Fred and Ina Lane's house at Beaton, August 1970. Uh, Fred Lane was a native of the Lardo who moved out to Vancouver for a few decades, uh, had a uh, recurring segment about pioneers where he told old tales on CBC radio. But then he moved back to Beaton with his second wife. That uh, little shed next to the house says, Beaton Power Plant, powered by moonshine. <laughs> two quarts per kilowatt, two bits a shot. Not endorsed by the Liquor Control Board, under police protection. <laughs> there you go, moonshine shed. And there they are, inside the house, and his wife giving him a haircut at the kitchen table. Or at least pretending to, for the purposes of the photograph. <laughs> we have a castle. Well, half of one. But this is Bill Lox's castle that he built at his property on Apple Grove Road. It caught fire uh, a few years after his passing. So these are the charred remnants of it. That's now, that land is now part of, owned by the Land Conservancy. And the thing about it, being an old spooky castle that Bill Locks made from his own hand-fired bricks, a lot of bats nested up in that belfry. Eventually about 1,500 bats. So after the place burned, uh, the Land Conservancy uh, built a bunch of towers for these homeless bats. So if you see that property, there's all these little wooden towers all over it. And that's uh, for uh, little roofs for these uh, 1,500 bats. I built them. You built them? Cool. Ha -ha. How long ago was that now? Like... <laughs> this is one of my favorite shots just from an artistic point of view. And this is actually a net shot. This is the old August Scribe house on the Orca property, which was right next door to the Lost property. But it's just a great shot. Just the atmosphere of it. Sandin, 1955, the year the town was destroyed. The, uh, okay, so never identified what Maxfield boys these are. But it's 1955, so I'm... Charlie. Char Charlie's got to be one. Charlie. Yeah. Charles and Doug. Charles and Doug. Yeah. We figured, because Graham would have been too young. Bunty would have been too young. Yeah, Graham was, yeah, he's a lot younger, and Bunty would have only been six. So. Yeah. Yeah. so, but yeah, you can see the, uh, the washout's still fresh, right? This is another washout, 22 years earlier. This is a great shot because it actually shows you the flume that contains uh, Carpenter Creek, upon which the main street of Sandin was built. Which is why when you go there today, all the buildings that are left, they face the route. Like if you go to the city hall, the prospector's pick, it traces the creek. But that's because the main street was actually over top of that flume. There's the original railway slip at McCusp. Again, the McPhee house at top left to give you an idea of where that train was. So this is where the Minto and the Bonington and the Kootenai would all meet the train and then take it up to Arrowhead or down to Robson. 
And then 1898, that's the Janelle Mill in the background where the marina is now. So the town of Janelle, named after the Janelle brothers, who owned that mill and a number of other mills. And uh, the Janelles built that house that is across from the post office next to the Savon parking lot. That was in that family. Yep. Uh, the old Cowan house, as we call it, because the Cowans are descendants of the Janelles. So that house was in that family from 1895 right up until the 2010s. If you keep going down from where Savon is now, down that street, through the parking lot, and you went down to the waterfront to Bay Street, there's where you would come out. And of course, nice glistening pavement, nothing's messy or dirty. It's not covered in horse manure at all. But even though they built Broadway to be the main street, um, that's why it's Broadway, because it's so wide. Wide enough that you could turn a team of horses around, 85 feet. Everything was on the waterfront until the 20s. And then a series of fires knocked out a few of the businesses, and they decided, you know what? Broadway was meant to be the main street. Let's just move our buildings up there. So a lot of our middle downtown core comes from the 20s because of that. When the Masonic building was built, and then the Edwards building where the health food store is, they were built in 22 and 24, and then they put the cenotaph in the middle of the intersection. That's what cemented that intersection as the middle of the cusp in the 20s. That's a great shot. 1940, one of the earliest color shots you'll see of around here. And that's going past the home ranch. And of course, that's a highway now. Right? They built the bypass right on top of that. So that's looking from the intersection with Churchill Road back towards that curve. And you see that train coming. Yep. That's another awesome train shot. This is along the Slocan River. A bit more modern train. But look how big it was. We don't think of the cut, you know, oh, just this little. No. There were some times where they have big, big long trains. The indoor, the, the inside the green door, which uh, hopefully one day will be the green door again. I love the vintage advertisements offering prizes from sponsors on top. So you got Overway and Hill and O'Brien service, that's the Canco now. Uh, Seldar, of course, Arrow Lake Supply and Furniture, which is located where Selkirk Realty is now. The High Arrow Lanes, later renamed Green Boy Lanes. So, in between the time, the couple, short couple of years between the dam and the completion of Highway 23, and the built, they launched the Galena Bay Ferry in 1969, but of course they leveled everything in 67, 68. So the ferry was still coming all the way from Arrowhead down to the cusp, four hour ferry ride. And that's what the ferry line looked like after they had built the barrier on the waterfront, but before they uh, built the, the Galena the next year. 69 is when they put the arbor on the waterfront. That later becomes the centerpiece of the Spicer Garden. You'll notice what the original walkway looked like with the benches parallel in the middle of the trail. <laughs> um, not, not optimal for walking. I have to say. The Watchan Hydroelectric Station, commissioned in 48, opened in 51, leveled by a landslide in 1953. You could still see the remnants of it. So they had to rebuild it. And of course, then they flooded, so they had to rebuild it again. <laughs> it did some damage. <laughs> It was so cursed that even equipment going in to clean up fell off the side of the road trying to get there. <laughs> so, with that, I bid you adieu. As you can see, the cusp in the background. I say, till next time, happy trails. <laughs> Cheers.
Thank you.